Welcome to the PlantMichiganGreen.com Gardening Show. Presented by the Michigan Nursery and Landscape Association. Now here's your garden show host, Dr. Bob Shutsky. Hello everyone. Welcome to the PlantMichiganGreen.com Gardening Show. Brought to you by the Michigan Nursery and Landscape Association. I'm Dr. Bob, your host for the 2021 gardening season. Tune in every Saturday at 4 p.m. through August. We will share gardening insights, feature guests from Michigan's green industry, and answer your questions submitted through plantmichigangreen.com, Ask the Expert. Our hope is to make the most of your outdoor living experience. During the week, you can log on to plantmichigangreen.com, your landscaping and horticulture resource, to pose gardening questions, find a professional horticulturist, locate a retail garden center in your area, or become aware of the rewarding careers in Michigan's green industry. Today's show is sponsored by Unilock, North America's premier manufacturer of concrete interlocking paving stones and segmented retaining wall products. And we are pleased to have Eric Aubey with us after a short break. So stick around and get into the garden groove on the plantmichigangreen.com gardening show on News Talk 760 WJR. Welcome back. We're pleased to have Eric Aubey of Unilock with us. Eric will share some thoughts on interlocking pavers, retaining walls, and other products for your outdoor living environment. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the PlantMichiganGreen.com Gardening Show. Hi, Bob. It's a pleasure to be on, and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Please tell us on how Unilock products can transform your outdoor living environment. I'd be happy to. I'd kind of like to start real quick with just like a brief history of Unilock. Um, for, for people that don't know, we've been manufacturing pavers for close to 50 years. Um, it'll actually be 50 years uh, this following year in 2022. And we were actually the, uh, the first paving stone manufacturer in North America. Uh, it kind of all started uh, when our, our founder wanted to have a, uh, a product he came across called the Uni Stone installed in his driveway. And uh, he asked the stonemason that was doing some work at his property if he could get a quote on it and, and how much it would cost. And the guy said, well, it doesn't matter what it costs because you can't get it. Uh, no one makes it here in North America. So long story short, he connected with some people and, and got some, some rights to produce the product. And in 1972, Unilock was born. Um, and, and really, it's our focus from the beginning in terms of our manufacturing has been on quality and innovation. We really try to put the best possible product we can out in the marketplace for, for contractors and ultimately for homeowners and, and commercial uh, users as well to enjoy. And, and with that, we were the first manufacturer to offer a lifetime transferable warranty, which, which is a big deal giving contractors and, and homeowners peace of mind with the product. Um, it really kind of falls into three different categories when you look at our pavers. Uh, we try to have something for everyone, something for every budget, every project, and, and there's kind of a, a good, better, best progression with our products. We have our, our classic pavers. Uh, these are going to be your traditional 4x8 Holland Stone or tumbled Brussels blocks. Um, very high quality product, same mix of aggregates from top to bottom. We call that a, a through mix product. All the way through the product, it's the same blend of aggregates. And that's how pavers have been made you know, since we started in 1972. And as things kind of evolved and we innovated and, and we brought on new technologies, we were able to introduce what we now call our EnduraColor pavers. And this is what's more commonly known in the industry as face mix products. And what those products are is, is a combination of a two-part manufacturing process where you get a base of coarser aggregates for strength and overall durability, and that gets united and permanently bonded to a concentrated color and wear-resistant layer on the top of the product. So you get a cleaner finish that looks better longer, and, and this product category is what's become our most popular uh, with our, our Beacon Hill pavers, our Umbriano, um, newer products like uh, Holland Premier and Boulevard. Uh, homeowners and, and clients are really starting to gravitate to that cleaner, nicer finished product. Yeah, over the years I've been able to follow Unilock products uh, and it, they're very creative, very, very interesting in terms of following the trends that are that are occurring in landscape design and construction. Yeah, we really try to stay ahead of, of where the industry is going in terms of what the trends are, what people are looking for, so that we've got, like I said, we've got something for every project. Because every project isn't the same. You've got a, a vast array of, of tastes and things that people are looking for. And 
whether it's a very modern, clean, sleek look or it's more of a, a natural look. We've got products that kind of cover all the bases and we try to stay out in front of those changing trends as best as we possibly can. So what are, what are some of the new trends in, in outdoor spaces? So when you look at kind of where things are going in outdoor living spaces, I think, it, you know, right now you got to look at the fact that people are spending more time in those spaces. And as a result, they're demanding more of the spaces. Um, the, the, really, the, the biggest thing we saw demand for in terms of growth last year was vertical features like fire pits and fireplaces, grill islands, outdoor kitchens, you know, all the, the extra features that people really want to be able to enjoy when they're in those spaces. Um, along with that, we've, we've really seen a shift in kind of that more curvilinear design that we used to see for years with the kidney bean shapes and the sweeping curves uh, to more of a rectilinear design where the, the, the people spaces are being designed more square for, for more function and usability. And then the, the natural spaces are still being designed with that, the curves to kind of soften and, and change the, the overall look of it. Uh, large format pavers have been become very, very popular. It's shifted from smaller 4x8s or, uh, you know, the, the classical style pavers up to larger format and, and even big slabs and plank style pavers. And then, like I said, the, the refined surface textures. A lot of people are looking for a cleaner, smoother look. Um, they're almost looking like at their outdoor space like it's an extension of their kitchen or their dining area, and they want it to have that same look and feel. So that's kind of how we've seen things evolve over the, the last few years. That's, it's interesting that you mention the extension of their indoor spaces because quite often the designers are looking to do exactly that. You want to bring a little bit of the indoors out and a little bit of the outdoors in by, by having those those materials and the actual feel of the, of the outdoor rooms somewhat like, like the inside of the house. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's, I think, why we've seen such success with our, our Beacon Hill product, specifically the Smooth. It almost has, you know, it's not a tile, but it almost has that kind of kitchen tile feel to it when it's in your outdoor space. Yeah, cool. How about, how about can you tell us a little bit about how somebody would, would start to plan an outdoor space with some of your products? Yeah, for sure. So I think ultimately, you know, what you end up with in the end um, should be a reflection of, of how you intend to use it. So I think the first thing you got to look at with your outdoor space is, is what is our goal for the space? You know, are we, do we just want a nice casual space to sit down and enjoy and, and maybe have a fire pit or a fire table? Or you know, are we going to be entertaining and cooking and we need a dedicated kitchen space and a dining space? And, you know, we even see to the point that there's outdoor lounge spaces where you've got, you know, the, the television on a fireplace. And so it really depends on, on what are we going to use this space for? And I think it kind of stems from that. And then, and then when, you, when you get further into actual product selection, that's really going to be a matter of, of personal taste. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about colors when, you know, we meet with contractors and we meet with homeowners and we're discussing helping them figure out their project. And, you know, well, there I ask, well, you're, you're the expert. What, what color do you suggest? And, you know, we like to say, like, there's not really a wrong color because it's a matter of taste. There's good options. There's really good options. And then there's home runs. And you're, you're the only one as the end user who can really pick that out in terms of that finished style and color. So um, that's kind of the guidance I like to give in, in product selection. Well, great. Well, well, let's uh, uh, let's hold that thought and come back. So, stay tuned for more with Eric at Unilock and the PlantMichiganGreen.com Gardening Show on News Talk 760 WJR. Welcome back to more of the PlantMichiganGreen.com Gardening Show with your host, Dr. Bob Shutsky. Welcome back. We're here with Eric Aubey of Unilock and have been talking about transforming your outdoor living environment with pavers, walls, and other hard features, hardscape features in the landscape. Eric? Yeah, so we were just kind of talking about the product selection process and how you kind of go about that. And, and, and commonly, um, you know, I think people don't fully grasp or understand. I know I didn't when I was new, new to this industry, um, what the cost impacts really are when you're selecting a product. And when you look at the overall project, your pavers really only add, add up to be about 20% of the overall cost of that project. And the reason for that is because you're paying for everything that happens underneath that product to make sure you've got a stable, solid project that's going to hold up. And I like to use the comparison that, like, don't think of your pavers as your kitchen floor because the majority of all the prep work is done 
and the kitchen floor is being installed on an existing subfloor. When you're building an outdoor space, all that prep work has to be done. So the excavation, the labor involved, the backfill, all the prep work to make sure that it's going to be solid and that project's going to stand the test of time, that's that 80% that you don't see when that project's finished, but that 80% is critical to the success of that project. Yeah, you know, that, that's often true. Quite often we, we uh, uh, hear from contractors that they've gone in to repair or fix somebody else's work where the pavers have shifted, they've settled, and, uh, and a lot of that's related to the uh, base course or bedding layer and how, how good the, uh, uh, it was in terms of laying those materials down. Yeah, and as an industry, we've learned a lot over the last you know, 50 years of, of having hardscape products here in North America. And, and it, things continue to evolve, methods evolve, get better over time. And we've really come a long way, even in the last 10 years, in terms of installation methods. And uh, you know, it's great to see the industry evolving and putting an emphasis on quality construction and, and understanding and, and moving things forward with that base construction. Could you tell us a little bit more about your products and how a person would go go through your catalogs and actually decide on a particular product? Sure, absolutely. I think one of the best tips to give when it comes to the catalog is literally when you're flipping through it and you're looking through all those beauty shots of, of the finished projects and all the features and amenities that are involved and in, included in it, I think the best thing to do is when you, when you come across something that you really like, and maybe you're not even sure what aspect of the project you like, you just like the look of it, just earmark that page, fold it over, and keep flipping through and, and do that on each page that a project or you feel a product really jumps out to you. And what we find is when, when people go through and do that and then they go back and look at those earmarked pages, very commonly they, they've pretty much selected their product without realizing it because it's very consistent through those photos. And that helps really pinpoint the style. And then from there, it's a matter of picking the right color for the environment with the house and all the, the landscape that's going to surround it. Now, what about what about patterns? When when you look at that style, could you explain what it what uh, they should be consider in terms of the brick itself, and then the pattern, how they relate to each other? Yeah, so there's most products are going to have multiple different patterns or laying patterns that they could be installed in, and and some of that is going to be relative to the product itself, how it's designed. And Beacon Hill, for example, we've we've designed that with two different patterns for different looks. Uh, but that's a random bundle. You get three different sizes all packaged together, so you buy all three together. Uh, when you look at a product like our Brussels block, that's there's three different sizes in that as well, but they're sold individually. So if you just like the smaller look, of the, the look of the smaller stones, you can get a patio of just that. If you want the larger, you can do that, or if you want to blend them, you can. So when you talk about laying patterns, they're really based on the product, and you're going to have more or less options kind of based on what the product is. Um, and those the patterns are designed to maximize the use of the product, but also give you different looks. And, and the, a lot of it is going to be based on the product you select, but also, you know, the contractor and, and their familiarity with, with the, uh, the patterns in the installation, as well as the look of the home to kind of determine which way to go. Quite often I get asked from, uh, from individuals saying, how large does my patio have to be? And so could you help us with, with giving us some, some tips or pointers on, on how people should consider or what they should consider when it comes to sizing their, their patios? Absolutely. And I like to say bigger than you think. Um, and not because we're trying to sell more products, but when you think about a space outdoors, um, think of it similar to like building a shed or a garage. And you think, oh, you know, a 20 by 20 garage is a big garage. I can fit two cars in it. Well, then you realize with that 2020 garage, you can only fit the two cars in it and you can't fit really anything else. So um, outdoor spaces feel smaller than indoor spaces. So, so most people usually tend to say, I wish I would have had a few more feet this direction or that direction or have it a little bigger because they, they think in terms of indoor spaces and the size. So, um, but it really comes down to what you're going to use it for again, kind of the how am I going to, how am I intending to use this space? and kind of designing it around that. Um, but for a walkway, there's kind of a standard. I mean, a three foot walkway is gonna really be like a minimum width if you're, if you're building some kind of walkway. And the wider you go, the better, because if you go four feet or even five, maybe you have two people walking past each other and they can get by without bumping into each other or walking off the, pa off the, the path. So 
Um, th that's kind of a general rule for walkways. In terms of patios, that's really just uh, a preference and, and how you plan to use it, and it's hard to put a real number to it. But uh, keep in mind, it's it, it, most people think I should have gone a little bigger because it's an outdoor space and it doesn't feel as big as I thought it would when it was finished. One of the things that I think people don't keep in mind when they're developing a patio is there has to be circulation around through that patio. So if they, they have a table and chairs, how do you get around it? If they have a, have a grilled area, how do you get around the grill being far enough away from the grill so that the safety is not an issue? And so not only do you, do, you, do you figure the square footage of the furniture and other elements that you're putting on the patio, but you also have to, to keep in mind some square footage for circulation around and through that. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's essentially the same as when you design a kitchen. I mean, you, you figure out the, the overall size of the room, the placement of the components, and then do we have enough walking space and ADA compliance and, and things like that to make sure you can navigate the space and, and use it as intended. So that's a great point. Can you, can you tell us about the, the, uh, uh, the other elements that you may have, fire pits, uh, fireplaces, things along that line? Yeah, so we have a few fire pit kits that make uh, installing and building fire pits very easy. Um, there's a couple options in, in our Brussels uh, dimensional system where you can build either a square or a round fire pit, and there's a metal insert ring that's designed to fit right with that. Uh, so that's a quick, easy way to be able to incorporate a fireplace into a design, which fireplaces are the most commonly ver incorporated vertical feature in a, in a hardscape uh, project. And then there's products like our, our elements, fireplaces, and, and components. And these are primarily pre-built, pre-constructed units, uh, come usually in two pieces. They're skid steer place, so you'd, you'd get everything ready from a prep standpoint, and you'd set the base of the fireplace in, and then you'd pick the upper part up and set it on top and, and can finish the construction of that unit. A little more in-depth, uh, but if someone wants an you know, outdoor fireplace, that's an a, a easy way to, to add one. And then we've got our Ucara modular system, which was new for us uh, n not too long ago, where um, you're really able to build vertical features in hours versus days. Um, those are typically very time-consuming components of a project, and this is essentially a lightweight aluminum frame that you construct that frame using a series of bolts, and then you hang our fascia panels from our Ucara system on it to finish it off, and, and literally it, it reduces it down to hours instead of days. That's, that's great. One of the things that I found extremely useful is looking through your catalogs and then going on your website and, and uh, uh, looking at the videos that you have. Very, very creative. They give you an awful lot of ideas and then also the instruction that, that goes along with it. So extremely helpful for people interested in your products to, to visit your website. We actually are, go, are undergoing a massive overhaul of our contractor website uh, currently, and that will be launched soon. Uh, the, the homeowner version of the website has actually already been completely overhauled and, and is available now. If you just go to the, the web address, unilock.com, uh, it should default to that homeowner web page. Uh, make sure you select the proper region so our, our product selector knows where you're located and you get Michigan products. Um, but again, unilock.com, uh, it's a great resource. Just check the website out. So for our listeners today, if, if they wanted to get in touch with you or, or uh, uh, identify a retail outlet or a contractor, how could they do that? Uh, the easiest way would be one of two ways. Uh, you mentioned the website. You go right to the website, and uh, right on the main menu, you can click on where to buy. Um, you can also uh, find a contractor right through our website. And so that's a very quick, easy way um, to identify our, our dealer network and also help, help you locate a contractor. Um, people can also call our 1-800 number, 1-800-UNILOCK, and uh, we'd be happy to assist with getting facilitating that, that connection between a contractor or recommending a, a dealer location to, to purchase. Great. Well, well, thanks. You know, this has been really helpful for our listeners, and you you provided an awful lot of useful information. Thanks for joining us today and sharing all of this with us. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. And, and for the listeners, if you have any questions on walks, driveways, retaining walls, outdoor kitchens, fire pits, or anything more, please visit our website, plantmichigangreen.com, and click on Ask the Expert. Submit your questions. And uh, uh, we'll work with Eric and, and anybody else to get the best possible answers for you. 
So stick around because up next, some gardening insights on the PlantMichiganGreen.com gardening show right here on 760 WJR. Welcome back. Here is some more useful information on hardscape features in your landscape. And I can't, I have to reiterate, check out Unilock's website. It has three sections, dream, full of creative ideas, products showcasing all of their products, and then learn and plan, useful information for planning or doing it yourself. I enjoyed their video, Love Your Outdoors, on their website. It certainly inspires a whole bunch of creative ideas. I like the details for the do-it-yourselfers under learn and plan. Looking at the instructions and procedures, that often helps with the decision whether you're going to go it alone or hire a contractor. For additional ideas, you can check out the Inspiration Gallery on the PlantMichiganGreen.com website. Both Unilock and the PlantMichiganGreen.com websites can help with finding a certified contractor to help, help both design and install any type of hardscape features. I recently received a call from Ben, a landscape contractor and former student. He told me about several new clients where he had to fix paver walks and patios that had settled or shifted within five years of construction. The problems were related to improper installation of the base course and or bedding layers. He emphasized that what is below the surface is as important as what is at the surface. And Eric also mentioned that in his, uh, uh, in his discussions. If you're interested in a paver project, here are the steps installing a paver walker patio. Excavation, gravel base, bedding layer, laying the pavers, edge restraints, jointing materials, and sealers. The depth of excavation depends on the soil type and will vary between 6 to 8 inches. The bottom of the soil should be firm and at the same grade as the final surface. Uneven bottoms will contribute to settling and shifting of the surface over time. And that's one of the, the biggest misconceptions for the do-it-yourselfer. You have to have an even body because any type of pits or holes or irregularity in the bottom of that, that excavation Will, will eventually impact the surface of the pavers. The gravel base is usually four to eight inches deep depending on the surface activity. Driveway base courses are deeper than walkways or patios. The gravel needs to carry the weight and allow drainage through the pore space between the gra gravel pieces. It's important to fill the gravel base and compact it in layers. This is another critical point when you're putting in your base course. You put the gravel base in layers and compact it in layers. So you put two inches down, compact it, put two inches down and compact it. And that allows for uniform compaction and avoids any future settling. The final level of the grace or the gravel base also aids in water drainage off the surface of the pavers. The gravel base should be extended out from the surface dimension to include the areas for the edge restraints. So if you have a 12 by 12 patio surface, you need to extend that gravel base at least six inches out on each side of that, that, that patio edge. Bedding layer is usually one to one and a half inches of sand or stone chip material. It is compacted and is set at the same grade as the surface. The bedding layer allows for minor adjustments in heights of the pavers to ensure a uniform surface. The bedding layers follow the same final grade of the base course to account for any drainage off the paver surface. Everything below the paver surface has to work together in terms of allowing surface drainage. The pavers are laid on the surface of the bedding layer and the heights are adjusted as needed. The bedding layer allows the pavers to be seated into the material and firms its placement. Edge restraints are used to secure the edges of the pavers. It keeps them from shifting out of place. There are several different materials and brands to choose from, plastic to metal alloy. Important factors in using edge restraints are its location tight to the paver 
and having enough anchors. You follow the instructions given with the, the, the uh, edging materials and it's real important not to cut the amount of anchoring short. Jointing materials are spread into the joints between the pavers. They're swept into the cracks, washed in if necessary, and swept in some more. Jointing compounds include fine silica sands or polymetric sands. It's important to follow the directions when using polymetric sands to prevent hazing. There's a, a hazy surface that can happen if the polymetric sands get wet and are allowed to sit on the pavers. Sealers prolong the appearance of the surface and the surface quality of the pavers. Check with your supplier for the best sealer and procedures for applications. Here are a few terms to also help in your planning. Tumbled. A tumble stone is a concrete or other stone product that is tumbled in a mixer to give it a weathered or aged appearance. Quite often when, you're, when you look at the tumbled materials, it looks, looks somewhat archaic and again that weathered look. Flamed or thermal treated. Some natural stone is treated with a torch on the surface to give it a textured surface. That textured surface is desirable when you would want something that has a non-slip surface. Wet laid or dry laid. Wet laid means the paver is placed in a cement mortar. The bedding layer is mortar and the pavers are seated in the wet mix. Some contractors will install a concrete layer on the gravel base course and add the bedding layer of sand on the concrete layer. Pavers are then placed into the bedding layer. The concrete layer aids in the integrity of the surface. Dry laid is simply the procedures described above, no concrete involved. Most concrete pavers will be, will be installed with little or no joints due to the molding process. Clay pavers, however, may not be as uniform as concrete pavers and jointing compounds are used to fill in those joints and give it an overall uniform appearance. Natural stones are also used in paving. There are many different types of natural stone. That depends on the area where they're quarried. And they usually come in three types, outcropping, wall stone, and flagstone materials. Wall stones can be thin or thick walled, and this relates to the thickness of the stone. Their widths and lengths are more in line with appropriate wall construction dimensions. Flagstone is quarried for paving purposes. They also can be sold as natural, irregular, or dimensional. Natural is the irregular shape of the stone when it's quarried. Dimensional means it is cut into uniform squares or rectangles, usually in multiples of three inches. The thickness of flagstone can vary depending on whether it is wet laid or dry laid. It is desirable to have uniform thickness for wet laying natural stone. Usually it's one inch plus or minus. Natural stone for dry laying is variable in thickness, not only between the stones, but also within individual stone pieces. The bedding layer is usually thicker when installing natural stone as dry laid to, to accommodate for these varied thicknesses. No joints. Irregular stone is another story. Okay, it takes time and craftsmanship to match stones with uniform joints. It is an art to mix and match these natural irregular stone pieces to make uniform jointing throughout your, your walk or patio. There are several popular natural stones on the market, Ohio or New York bluestone. And the difference between the two states is slightly different colors between the quarries. Lilac flagstone is a similar product to bluestone, but with a burgundy lilac color. Storm Mountain flag comes from out west and has a slightly sparkle in the stone. Sandstone is another uh, flagstone material that has a gritty surface reflective of its sandy makeup. Sandstone usually does not wear as well as the bluestone products. Natural stones can be very attractive and creative in either the natural setting, its irregular patterns, or with the dimensional uh, cut patterns. So stay tuned for more on PlantMichiganGreen.com Gardening Show right after this short break on 760 WJR.
Now back to more gardening with your host, Dr. Bob Shutsky, on the PlantMichiganGreen.com Gardening Show. Here's Dr. Bob. Welcome back. What we'd like to do now is just to give you some, some uh, up-to-date information and uh, some gardening insights and then answer some of the questions that have come in through PlantMichiganGreen.com, Ask the Expert. May has been declared Oak Wheel Month in Michigan to bring attention to the disease that has been impacting our natural and planted oak population. Oak wilt causes leaves of effective trees to wilt and turn brown. There are two broad oak groups, the red oak group and the white oak group. The red oak group has pointy uh, leaf margins. The white oak group has rounded leaf margins. Okay, the oak wilt is fatal for the red oak group, including northern red oak, pin oak, scarlet oak, and black oak. White oak in the white oak group is affected, but usually not as severe. The incidence of oak, oak wilt have been increasing in Michigan in recent years. Oak wilt is a fungus disease that moves through the water-conducting tissues of the tree. The fungus spores are carried to the tree by small beetles that feed on sap of fresh wounds. These sap beetles that carry the disease from infected trees are attracted to fresh wounds from storm damage, pruning cuts, or other injuries previous to uninfected trees. Once the beetle, beetles feed and the fungus moves into the water conducting tissue, the tree reacts and tries to ward off the spread of the disease by plugging cells which causes the branches to wilt. The disease can also spread from already infected oaks by moving through root grafts between the trees of the same species. Root grafts are obviously under the ground, and if one root comes in contact with, with roots of another tree and they, they fuse together, they can transmit the disease. One simple measure that can help prevent the spread of oak wilt is to not prune any oaks during the growing season. This will prevent fresh wounds that draw in the sap beetles that may carry the oak wilt fungus. Storm damaged trees may be needed to be pruned during the summer or to remove broken branches when this is done. Make sure all wounds are sealed with a tree wound dressing or latex paint. Sealing wounds must be done immediately since the fresh wounds attract the beetles. For more information on oak wilt, you can go online and, and uh, Google oak wilt identification and management from Ohio State University Extension. To round out this week's PlantMichiganGreen.com gardening show, we have some questions and comments that have come in to PlantMichiganGreen.com Ask the Expert. Dave submitted a previous question on his apple trees and he sent a follow-up with images of the trees. Here's my response. The trees look fine. They're relatively young. However, I recommend pruning the overall shape of the trees into a cone like a Christmas tree. This is typically done for semi-dwarf apple trees in commercial orchards. And he should take approximately 6 to 12 inches off the edge of the branches to achieve the cone and then spread and tie them into the horizontal position that we previously described. We received a, a question from Sherry, and I'm going to paraphrase her question. I have, two question. I have two questions regarding butterfly bushes. We have had butterfly bushes at our other home, and I know they're supposed to be trimmed way down in the spring, but do they have to be trimmed? The second question is a live and learn. We planted 12 young butterfly bushes last night, and it went down below freezing. This morning, they look pretty good no damage. By 6 p.m., they look pretty bad. Some normal green leaves, some very dark leaves, and, curled, and very curled and dried leaves. How do you recommend dealing with these? Trimming butterfly bushes down in the spring is usually the recommendation for two reasons. The first is due to their growth habit and form. They get large and gangly. By pruning them down, the responding growth will be uniform when it returns. The second is due to their marginal stem hardiness in most of Michigan. Keep in mind that this varies with different cultivars. Winter temperatures usually kill some buds while others remain fine. As a result, the plant will respond in spring with some live branches and some dead. 
Root systems are alive, and if pruned, it will regenerate new shoots from the crowns. This will provide a uniform, attractive plant with plenty of flowers. They do not have to be trimmed. However, you need to wait and see whether you have all live stems, dead stems, or a mix of both. Prune out the dead stems, take a look at the plant. If you like what you see, great. If not, prune it to a shape that is appealing. The second question, the most recent frost took its toll on a lot of tender shoots. It did not kill the entire stem nor the root systems. I would recommend pruning the very dark and dried leaves and again, just the leaves. You cut the stem in the vicinity of the dark and dried leaves. If the inside of the stem is tan or brown, cut it down to where you see bright green. If the inside of the stem is bright green and moist, you leave it. It should come back with, it, with new leaves in, as the season progresses. And based on what you've described, if you have one to two feet of green stems, they should come back with no problem at all. Please note that horticulture translates science into practice, and research over time has worked out the cause and effect in growing plants. For us, it's important to be aware of the science of plant growth and how it influences soil, is influenced by soil, climate, pests, and other outside influences. And many times it's not as easy as black and white. We make judgment calls based on the information that we have. In diagnosing plant problems, the more information we have about the plant and its location and what has been done or not done to it, this helps in arriving at a reasonable conclusion in our ability to prescribe a remedy. Pictures help. So don't forget to visit our website, plantmichigangreen.com, and click on Ask the Expert to submit your landscape and gardening questions. You may hear your question and answer on the air. Remember to tune in every Saturday at 4 p.m. through August for the best information and advice to maximize your outdoor living experience. And during the week, log on to plantmichigangreen.com, your landscaping and horticulture resource. To find a professional, a retail garden center, pose gardening questions, or explore rewarding careers in the green industry. That's all for this week. I'm Dr. Bob, wishing you sunshine, a little rain, and happy gardening. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the PlantMichiganGreen.com Gardening Show with Dr. Bob Shutsky. Presented by the Michigan Nursery and Landscape Association.